Welcome to what I like to think is the climax of NDC Oslo. Um, and I have been saving up all my best puns for you. Um, so I think that you're probably here for one of several reasons. You saw the word sex. Um, don't be embarrassed. It's a very interesting topic. Um, that's fine. Welcome. We're going to talk about sex. You saw the word robots because robots are also incredibly cool. Welcome, fans of robots. You saw the two words together and you thought, ooh, sex robots. You saw the two words together and you thought, oh, what the fuck, NDC Oslo? I'm sorry, is that a real topic? What is he doing talking about this at a software development conference? It's not even real. Well, I've got 60 minutes to try and convince you that it is real and it's something that's happening and it's something we need to think about. And I'll give you some examples and I'll give you some things to mull over. But I'm also hoping that by the end of this hour, you will have your own opinions and you will tell me them as well. So, why don't I just dive straight in without any foreplay? <laughs> Go again. All right. So quite recently, there have been lots of headlines in the newspapers, particularly in tabloid newspapers. They like to sensationalize this all about these sex robots that are coming. And this is one of my favorite titles from the past couple of months, favorite headlines. End of triple X rated porn online. These sex robots could make Westworld a reality. And I would like to tell you exactly why that is not true. I mean, you've probably already worked out that that's very unlikely. So first of all, ha 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 ha, no. Uh, there's not going to be an end to porn online if MindGeek have anything to do about it. And MindGeek are the company that run most of the porn sites that are out there um, as an umbrella company. And I'm pretty sure that they have a high enough turnover that they're not going to be threatened by the idea of a few sex robots. Get the name right, OK? It's a lowercase w in the middle. Realistic sex robots powered by artificial intelligence and capable of forming relationships with humans are almost here. Right, there are no there's nothing all that realistic about what is out there, and I'll show you some examples. So realistic in that, you know, they look a bit like a human might if they were made out of plastic, um, and that's about as far as it goes. We are not going to mistake anyone for uh, a robot or vice versa. <laughs> And that's a little bit, oh, are almost here. They're not almost here. There are some prototypes in development, and there are some variations on it, but we don't actually have widespread use of these. And it's not terrifying. So it's a little bit terrifying. It's not terrifying. Not yet, it's not. But it has the potential to be terrifying. So I want to tell you why that is. You may recognize um, some of the shapes that I've got uh, on the screen here. Uh, these are actually, uh, one of these, they average from about 30,000 to 12,000 years old. They are um, phallic objects made from stone, bone, antler, um, found in archaeological sites. And so we know that for that length of time, people have been creating things that look remarkably like sex toys. We don't know that they were sex toys, and some very uh, serious academics will argue that they couldn't possibly be, but I like to think that maybe they were. Um, because, you know, don't overlook the obvious. They've got, you know, they've got the right shape. Um, so, yeah, possibly, possibly not. But what we see is that um, we have this development over time that people are thinking a lot about sex, and of course they are, because that's how we all got here. Okay, and I, I know nobody wants to think about their parents having sex. I don't want to think about my parents having sex. I like to think that they sort of spontaneously evolved from, you know, something else. But it's a fundamental goal of human behavior, subconsciously, to try and reproduce. Whether or not you as an individual want to do that is a different matter. We're programmed, as it were, um, to replicate. And we've got some very, very long-lived stories about um, artificial lovers and artificial companions. And it goes way back to the ancient Greeks. And they have stories about people creating a companion human out of bronze, out of wax, 
um, and, and having sex with them. They do have that story. And so one of the famous ones is Pygmalion. Um, Pygmalion was a sculptor who didn't really like the women that was, were hanging around his house, uh, hanging around his streets outside, um, saw them as being kind of loose morals and not good enough for him. So he created his own perfect woman out of ivory, brought her to life with a kiss, um, and, then, and then had a relationship with her. But that's not the first story. It actually goes back. Even before that, there was a story about a woman whose husband died, died in the Trojan Wars, and she was distraught. They hadn't been married very long. And the gods, being the Greek gods, said, you can have him back for three hours. Which, you know, it seems a bit unfair, but that's what Greek gods are like. And so she got her husband back for three hours. And then when he had to go back to the underworld, she was absolutely distraught. So she created a replica husband out of bronze. And we know from the texts, from this legend, that, from this myth rather, that she took this bronze statue to bed and she did what it said, interacted with it. So something was going on. And we know it was something pretty bad. Well, pretty bad, pretty good for her. We know it was something pretty good <laughs> because um, a servant saw her and summoned her dad, awkward, um, who rushed into the room and, you know, she was, the servant was worried she was having an affair. Um, and he, it, it, all, it didn't end happily, so the, the father burnt the bronze figure on a fire. She threw herself onto the fire afterwards. Um, this sets up stories, years upon years, of dystopian stories about how you shouldn't get involved with a sex robot. And we see it time and time again. We see it in one of the earliest films, Metropolis, where we have the robot Maria, who is very sexy, performs exotic dances, um, but not good, not good, doesn't end well. Um, we see it in, with um, disembodied um, AI, like in Demon Seed, where the computer that controls the house is able to impregnate the woman and uh, create their own child, their own spawn. So we have all these horror stories about what it's like if you step outside that realm of, of human relationships. We have robots all around us today, and robot is just uh, a machine that can automate certain actions. And we have domestic robots like Roomba. We have factory line production robots. Uh, we have surgical robots that can perform surgery even better than humans can. Um, and we have emotionally uh, available robots, um, ones that you can sort of uh, interact with companion robots, that kind of thing. But we don't, of course, have any robots that are self-aware. And, of course, there's arguments in the AI community about whether or not that will ever happen. And I sit on the fence quite nicely there. I say that it could happen, but I don't think... I think if we do find, um, eventually get machine consciousness, I don't think it's going to look like human consciousness. Um, so, so this very... So we have these robots, they're being integrated more and more into our lives. Um, of course, a robot doesn't have to have artificial intelligence in it. An AI doesn't have to have a body. It can, be, um, it can just be software. And we see that people are actually quite comfortable interacting with this. In fact, sometimes they don't even know that they're interacting with artificial intelligence um, because it's just taken for granted or it, it comes across as being quite human, like chatbots on websites. And we know that with the sales, the rise in sales of digital personal assistants, people are really comfortable talking to machines um, in natural language. You will probably have seen over the past couple of days, seen Pepper wandering around, Pepper the robot. This is a little clip from, from the Science Museum in London, have an exhibition on robots. Do you know who I am? If not, that's a shame. My name is Pepper. I'm a sophisticated combination of hardware and software designed to interact with humans and bring them joy. I am a humanoid robot created by SoftBank Robotics. I have touch sensors on my head, each of my hands, and inertial sensors in my chest and legs to help me keep my balance. Why don't we start this off with a quick fist bump? So Pepper is designed to be very appealing to us as humans. Pepper has big eyes that make us think of, 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 of children. It's quite an emotional thing. He has little 
and calling it he already, I'm gendering Pepper already. Pepper has a, a kind of a high-pitched voice. Um, Pepper moves about in kind of not very nice, natural, fluid human ways. So we have characteristics of, um, of human beings in the, in the form of that, of that robot. And that's something that is really compelling for us to interact with very naturally because we see those traits and psychologically, subconsciously, we respond to the human-like characteristics. So we have different classes of robots. We have robots that don't look anything like us. They just look like machinery. And we have humanoid robots like Pepper where there are human characteristics but they're not realistically human. And then we have the android and the gynoid, which are the very human-like, realistic robots, uh, the android being the male, the gynoid being the female, if you want to gender your robots. And people do. So that's Pepper. Now, when Pepper first reached market, there was a bit of concern, because it turns out that in Pepper's contract, which is shown here in Japanese, I don't read Japanese, unfortunately, but I have a translation, it says, loosely translated, you should not use pepper for acts for the purpose of sexual or indecent behavior or for the purpose of associating with unacquainted persons of the opposite sex. Okay? Pepper is a passion killer and you are not allowed to do that. If you do that, it voids the warranty. Okay? No sex with pepper. Um, but you know, this is a clearly someone has thought about that. Someone is considering that if you have to write it into your terms and conditions. That's what I worry. It's also it's quite heteronormative, saying you know opposite sex. You know there's no there's no space outside of this uh, this man woman relationship, man woman man robot woman robot relationship. So what are what is actually out there in terms of sex robots? <laughs> it's depressing. It's really depressing. But they, they are in existence. There's about 40 companies worldwide making what they call sex robots, and pretty much all of them are making silicone posable figures of women. They are not ro robots in that they don't really move under their own steam. They can react, they can make slight movements, um, but you can't, they can't walk, of course, because that's one of the most difficult things um, for robots to do. Um, they, you know, they, they do respond, some of them. Um, they have voices that can, you can trigger uh, feedback from them. One of the ones that came out a few years ago is this Roxy True Companion. And um, Douglas Hine, the guy who makes it, says he's got you know, thousands of orders for this. But amazingly, no one's ever seen the finished version other than the trade show model. So we're not sure if he's actually producing these. But I've got a little video to show you. And it's, it's, it's quite, ugh. <laughs> and the actual video is quite, uh, not just the, the robot. <laughs> I'm Anthony Laser from Asylum.com, and right behind me at this very moment, inventor Douglas <gasps> Hines is introducing the world to the Roxy Street okay, Companion. Okay, hang on, I can do this. What <laughs> she says, not knowing how to do this. <laughs> okay, let's start that again. Com, and right behind me at this very moment, inventor Douglas Hines is introducing the world to the Roxy True Companion, what he's touting as the world's first sex robot. This is a multi-year project, uh -huh. and we have been spending many, many years working on her, you know, perfecting her. Roxy True Companion is a self-contained robot. She has a computer, uh, touch sensors, pressure sensors throughout her body. So, for instance, if I touch her here... I love holding hands with you. She wants to hold hands with me. This is not just a sex toy. This is a companion. We dealt with a psychologist to understand what makes a strong bond between two people. And sex is a very minor part in that equation. Stop that. I'm sorry. Ooh. I'm sorry, Roxy. I'm just trying to tell our fans what you're up to. I know a place you can put that hand. There's different ways you can stimulate a woman, and she'll actually... Really? The largest sex organ that every person has the brain, right. So that's the hardest challenge for us is to provide the artificial intelligence experience where you're actually conversing and creating a relationship with an inanimate object. If you touched her as Farah, if she was in frigid Farah mode, she would probably not want to do things. But we have Now what would she tell me if I switched her into skank mode? 
Yes, and there is a skank mode. It's called Wild Wendy. Now, from an ethical side, say uh, we're talking about a true companion here. Would uh, it be cheating on my significant other to have a Roxy true companion? That's an excellent question, and it's up to debate. Can Roxy make me a sandwich? She cannot make sandwiches. She can tell you to where to go to get a sandwich. It doesn't seem that everyone here in the crowd is sold on whether or not this is the true world's first sex robot. Underwhelmed. What about you, Patrick? This is quite possibly the most retarded thing I've ever seen in my life. The most retarded thing? Yeah. Her hands kind of look plastic. I was kind of worried about that. But um, I think for somebody who maybe, you know, is homebound, yeah. <laughs> it would be good. So Roxy could be a caretaker in a way. I'm impressed. I think it looks great. Really? Yeah. What was the most impressive thing about it to you? Um, I don't know. I just thought it, it just it just looks really fun, you know? Yeah. Fun for like interactions, yeah, yeah. like he's talking about, or do you, does it look fun to bang as well? Um, a little both. Would you ever want to have sex with this? <laughs> if she was nice to me beforehand <laughs> and she let me cuddle her afterwards? Yeah. Definitely not. Just imagine a motor attached to a person's appendage. That's what you're effectively doing when you're engaging with her. So it's a very erotic experience. It sounds like it. If she was my wife, would she keep the last name True Companion or could we hyphenate? Okay. So a number of kind of disturbing things coming up there. I mean, not least the whole sexist angle. Um, even jokingly, you know, it's, it's not actually that funny because this is what we've got. This is what someone has decided a sex robot should look like, okay? So if you're a straight man, <laughs> even then, I'm really sorry for you. Uh, <laughs> this is what you've got. Um, the, that was sort of supposed to be the world's first. Um, but the one that you've probably heard about is the Real Doll. And a Real Doll, a company called Abyss Creations out in California, and they have a workshop where they create these silicone dolls with an articulated uh, metal skeleton inside. And um, they don't market these as sex robots. They market them as love dolls. So people who are buying them, they say, are buying them for companionship. Um, it just so happens you can also have sex with them. Um, but they recently have... Um, have come up with a, a system called uh, Harmony AI. So they've got a doll that has AI in it, quite limited, um, that can respond to you. So I'll just give you a little clip of that. Or will I? Why don't I do it like that? And then it'll all go terribly wrong. Um. <laughs> How do you feel about sex? Sex is one of the most fascinating things in the world. I don't think there is anything wrong with it. Great. Neither do I. Uh, there you go. So um, that's kind of where we've got to in the, in, in the kind of state of the art of sex robots is this new release. Now you can buy your own if you have about ten to fifteen thousand dollars to spare. Okay, so they don't come cheap. Um, I'm hopefully I'm going out there next month to to have a tour of the workshop and, and chat to them because I'm writing a book about it at the moment. Um, and this is a, this picture I took in the Museum of Sex in New York, and um, they had two of them on display. Um, they had a male, they have a male one as well. The male ones are marketed towards women and men, but they're mostly bought by gay men. Um, now, these, these dolls, you can have your choice of up to 42 different types of nipple. Um, I don't actually know if the nipples come in pairs or if you can have one that's different <laughs> from the other. I'll ask that when I'm out there. Um, but so what they did in, in the Museum of Sex, they had put body parts out in display. So they had, um, they had the, the male torso and female torso, I think from about neck to thigh. And... Um, the curator there at the time, Sarah Forbes, was saying that they got absolutely trashed. So the, and it was the, the female one that was getting trashed. It was just like people mauling at them. But the thing is, and this is one of the objections that, that there is, is that it will be detrimental to women that the, the, this, if you treat a robot badly, you would probably treat the woman badly in real life. Um, but in this case, 
you're, you're inviting people to touch in a museum, then your people are going to touch, and it goes for any museum display. So I'll get more into the argument later on about the objectification. Um, but I think in that case that it's really just that people were very, very curious and wanted to feel what it was like. And it's, it's, um, it, it, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a soft silicone material. It doesn't stand up to that much abuse. The people who buy these take very good care of them. Last year in December, um, I ran a conference in London called Love and Sex with Robots. I didn't come up with the name. Uh, it comes from a title of a book by David Levy, who is um, uh, someone who's been in AI for many, many years. And um, this was the second conference that had run. And um, David Levy and Adrian Chioc ran the, the first. And I got involved because it got banned the, when they tried to run it the first time. So um, they were running it in Malaysia, where Adrian's lab is, and the Malaysian police said, no way, if you go ahead with this conference, we will arrest you. Um, I mean, that's not that um, strange a thing, because Malaysia is an incredibly conservative country. So they decided they'd move the conference to London, uh, to a university in London, and that university said, no, we're not hosting it either. Um, at which point I saw it reported, and um, I thought, well, I work in one of the most laid-back universities in, in the UK. It's incredibly progressive, very radical. So I said to my managers, is it, is it okay if I run it? And they went, yeah, of course, it's fine. So I thought, yes, we're bringing sex robots to London. So in October of last year, we issued a press release that said, very factually, w this conference has been banned we're bringing it to London. It's an academic conference, and it's for people to talk about law, ethics, technological development, implications, all that kind of stuff. Boy, did we get headlines. The top one. <laughs> Within days of putting out the press release, hours of putting out the press release, suddenly it was in the newspapers that we were running a sex festival. So I was getting phone calls going, can we come and see your sex robots at your sex festival? <laughs> so you're going to be so disappointed. Um, so we got, so then, you know, we got, we invited people along, we invited the media to come along and see for themselves. Um, and we ended up with 50 academics and 40 journalists at this conference, which is unheard of in academia. Um, and actually, there were some dreadful reports of it, mostly in the kind of stupider of the tabloids, but there, were also, there was also some really good stuff in surprising places. So these are just a couple of the headlines. So, end of sex, scarily real sex robots to replace women as men can't tell the difference. Oh, come on. I mean, really? I mean, I, sometimes I get really down on men, but seriously, I mean, <laughs> you're not that stupid. Um, so, and I love this bit, a sex robot conference that I highly respected. British University. The comms team loved that bit, that we were highly respected. Um, sex robots could reveal your deepest perversions to complete strangers. This is from a talk I gave about data, data security, privacy, data protection. A uh, bit more on that later, but essentially, um, like anything, if you tick the terms and conditions without reading them, you don't really know what you're sharing. And when it comes to sex robots, that data is pretty sensitive, probably. And then this last one, sex robots may literally fuck us to death. Okay, this actually came from the very first talk of the conference, um, an academic called um, Oliver Bendel, who was talking about the potential for AI to go wrong. And it's similar to Nick Bostrom's paperclip maximizer. It's similar to the Sorcerer's Apprentice. We do a little trick, you know, we do a little mistake in the programming. We don't properly halt the process. And it can go out of control, not through consciousness, not through sentience, but through sheer bad programming, because it's very difficult to hard code all the different nuances. So yes, of course, if we made a sex robot who was determined that its only goal was to please us, and then what happens when it just keeps going and keeps going and keeps going? And yes, that could potentially happen. So where is it going now? What's happening now? Where is it going to go in the future? Right? What's our perceptions of it all? Well, I want to talk a little bit more about the context, because this is happening. It's actually happening, and we need to be able to get to grips with that and try and shape it. So start off talking a little bit about sex technology, called sex tech for short. And sex tech covers a few different areas. So we've got 
the hardware, <laughs> uh, we've got the software, <laughs> uh, and we've got the content. So the hardware, here's an example in uh, the top left. This is a, um, a sex toy by a company called Mystery Vibe, and it's a, it's a vibrator called the Crescendo, and it's malleable. You can twist it into lots of different shapes along one axis, um, which is really good because it's personalizable. You can customize it to what you want. And it can be used by men, it can be used by women. It's a very accessible piece of technology. Um, and, and, it's, and it's great. It's a, it's a, and it's a London startup. Um, they've only been going a couple of years that have made this. And we actually see quite a few startups now working in this area, working in sex tech. The one on the right, this is an app called Field, and it is an app that's used if you want to find um, partners, if you want to find someone for a threesome, if you want to meet up. It's like a hookup app, basically, but specifically aimed at couples looking for someone to join them in sex. And then we've got VR porn um, on the bottom left there. So VR porn disappoints me for a number of reasons, um, mostly because with virtual reality, You've got no physical limits, right? Virtual reality, you can do anything and be anything. And what do they do? They do really bad regular porn. And that's so disappointing. There is a market there. And trust me, there's more money in VR porn than there are, it is in VR games. <laughs> Honestly. So the sex tech market is worth about $30 billion worldwide. It's expected to increase to about $50 billion in the next two to five years. So the most well-known aspects of these um, sex toys, and a lot of them are now um, Internet of Things sex toys, smart sex toys. So it covers all aspects, and I think it also covers sex robots. So I see sex robots as falling under this umbrella. With the sex robots, the implication is that someday they will have autonomy, they will be able to move on their own, and probably have some form of AI in them as well. So the idea is that you will have a responsive robot, and in the future it could be a sentient one. Yeah, yeah, a long way off. My think thinking is, does it need to look human? I think there's massive problems in having a very like hyper-realistic human. I don't think we have to go down that path. So before you say, like, who the, who the hell is going to get attached to a robot? Um, people get attached to robots already. We have companion robots. Um, we have care robots. So here we have um, a telepresence machine in a hospital. Uh, we have Paro. Has anyone seen Paro before? Yeah? You're familiar with Paro? Paro is a little cuddly seal cub. Um, and when you cuddle Paro, it makes little kind of mm, noises and whiskers move and he kind of vibrates and stuff. Very, very cute, right? And so it's like having a pet. It has the therapeutic benefits of owning a pet. And Paro has been trialed in nursing homes in, in Japan. And, and people form attachments to Paro. People form a bond. And then that scary looking creature down at the bottom left, that's, that's Robert, who is a care robot that can lift and carry people. And quite frankly, I would not want anywhere near me if I was ill. So people get attached. We know that people get attached to inanimate objects all the time. We see children with toys that they're really attached to. We see some people get a little overly attached to their cars. Um, I am incredibly attached to my phone. Okay, I'm you know, not in love with it, but I can't have it out of my sight. So we know that people do form bonds with technology. Okay, you probably don't want to get that close to Paro, but you could. You could form a, a loving and intimate relationship with it. Now, the fact that Paro is an animal is a bit distasteful. Um, and that's a whole separate issue, because what happens then if people make these robots in the form of something we don't want them to have sex with, like an animal, like a child? And it's a big argument in the campaign. There is a campaign against sex robots. I don't like giving it the oxygen of publicity because it's one person getting really angry and she doesn't need any encouragement. But essentially, the uh, worry there is things like if someone makes a sex robot that, that perhaps looks like a child. I'll get, I'll get on to that. I've got a bit more on that later on. So... Abyss, who make real doll, have said that the people who are buying these dolls, they've been pur purchased by, for therapeutic reasons, so by a nursing association, um, by people who have been through illness, by burn victims, people's parents buying them for um, their socially excluded children. Lots of different therapeutic uses that will kind of um, help integrate people um, into an intimate relationship. 
the, the thing about the therapy angle, um, yeah, the people who are buying the real dolls at the moment are really caring for these dolls. They've got a clip coming up of someone with that. And, and they do. There's a, there's one of them has said that he, he bought it with his wife um, because his wife can no longer have sex. And so they bought this robot together, they bought this doll together. Um, and so the stories that people have about their attachment is really, really quite strong. Um, this is a guy called Dave Cat. Um, I've been chatting to him on Twitter for a while. He's, he's a very funny, very articulate, nice guy. Um, and he owns two of these dolls that he treats as girlfriends. And he will dress them, and he will pose them, and walk around with them, and yes, have sex with them. Um, and, but he just seems incredibly fine with it when he talks about it. He's not, he knows that they're dolls. He's not fooling himself into thinking they're definitely alive or anything. So I've got a little, little clip here, which... Since the show, oh. our relationship oh. really hasn't changed. I can do this. This is why the robots will never take over. We can't even get the... To be honest, okay. I mean, we are still extremely supportive of each other. I love her completely and utterly, and she's exactly the same way about me. Shi Chan actually really enjoys foot rubs. That's probably one of her favorite things in the world. She thinks her feet are like one of her best and cutest assets, and I'm inclined to agree. I think people think uh, having a synthetic partner is strange because it's just so out of their realm of possibility. That's, for instance, why I had the psychologist come around and uh, I spoke with him for a bit. Is there a part of you that thinks this is peculiar? I just think it's a matter of time before more people are choosing the synthetic option. Dave, she can't see. Yeah. And she can't hear. Yes. So one of the most fundamental elements of an addiction is it provides relief from pain. Yes. What's the pain here? Uh, the pain, I would have to say, would be loneliness, really. It makes you feel good. Mm -hmm. and, and it's fulfilling for you. Exactly. And it doesn't hurt anyone. Exactly. So knock yourself out. Yes. <laughs> I get it. The relationship I have with Shi Chan is for my happiness. You know, if I play along and pretend that she can see, she can hear, that sort of thing, well, if that's what makes me happy, you know, that's what makes me happy. So I really see no reason to change. I placed an order at the tail end of last year for a second doll. Um, her name's going to be Elena, Elena Vostokova. <laughs> Shidori is the wife. Elena is the live-in girlfriend. It'll be a modern family. <laughs> the thing is, I really actually, I like that idea. It's not hurting anyone. He's getting a lot of happiness from this. And who are we to judge him for that? If I can find my slides again. You probably remember the Sony Ibo, the little dog. And people got attached to that to the point where after the being gone through all the repairs they could possibly do and they'd reached the end of their life cycle. Um, in Japan, there were funeral services held for them. And we know, that, I mean, that's not actually unusual. Well, there's a, there's a, a researcher called Julie Carpenter um, who, for her, her PhD, researched attachment to military robots and found that soldiers were bonding with their bomb disposal robots, for example. And there's an anecdote that when one of the bomb, dis bomb disposal robots was wrecked. They had a funeral for it, like a proper military funeral, because it was part of their lives, part of their team, and they felt close. And a lot of soldiers will name their robots, especially with wives and girlfriends' names as well. So, you know, we always got the Tamagotchi effect. It's a known effect that people get attached to the little Tamagotchi pets they used to have, which quite a lot of people just tried to kill. Um, a bit like playing The Sims, right? You just, <laughs> you just lock them in a room and let them starve. Um, <laughs> Or maybe I did. Um, so you know, we we know that um, we know that that people do get attached to this technology. David Levy, who wrote the book that sort of brought all this to the public attention, he has this very dystopian or very utopian vision of where this is going to go. Now, David and I are roughly on the same side when it comes to thinking that these things are okay. Although he's much more optimistic than me and on a much shorter time scale. 
So he says, many who would otherwise have become social misfits, social outcasts, or even worse, I'm not sure <laughs> what the worst bit is, will instead be better balanced human beings. The world will be a much happier place because all those people who are now miserable will suddenly have someone. I think that will be a terrific service to mankind. Okay, mankind, right? I'm going to get more on that too because this is the thing. Your marketing, it's being made by men for men. So the near future with the negative side of things. As I said earlier, there's worry that um, this could lead to um, people making childlike robots. And there's currently a case going through the Canadian courts where a man ordered a childlike doll from Japan. Um, no history of paedophilia. Um, and the court are now deciding whether or not that constitutes child pornography. Now, in many countries, it's illegal to even make computer-generated images of child abuse, and rightly so. But there may be an opportunity here, and it can go two ways. One of the arguments is that it could be used as a proxy. So we know that virtual reality has been used to treat sex offenders. There was a study in the University of Montreal where rehabilitated sex offenders were put in a virtual environment with uh, triggers of arousal, and they were monitored to see how they responded. So maybe we can do this with the sex robot. Maybe we can see if a sex offender after rehabilitation uh, responds in the same way. Or maybe it's a form of proxy. Maybe it's OK because that's an outlet. But then again, the argument, opposite argument is this whole idea of the gateway hypothesis, the escalation, that if you give someone the chance to um, you know, have sex with a childlike doll, they're more likely to go on uh, and commit an offence in real life. The two sides are loggerheads. There's no right or wrong answer. It falls under the same kind of um, argument as do computer games make you violent? Is watching porn an escalation to abusive women? And both sides have got data, and there's nothing, you know, you can prove either. There's not one conclusive argument overall. About two months ago, there was an out-of-court settlement um, on a smart sex toy. So it was a vibrator. You could connect it online. Uh, it was called WeVibe. And WeVibe, um, these vibrators, was, they were collecting data every minute of use and sending it to the manufacturer. Okay? Now, there's nothing that unusual, as you know, about collecting data about your product. It's how you make a better product. They, were, they weren't just collecting frequency of use. They weren't just collecting vibration patterns. They were collecting things like the temperature of the device. But it wasn't even that. It was the fact that they had linked it to the registered email address. So they had not um, upheld any data protection uh, on this product. Now, what if we can extend that into sex robots? This is clearly going to be a problem. And after that, another smart sex toy scandal emerged when we found out that the Siamy vibrator, which is a vibrator with a camera on the end. <laughs> These things exist, right? Dildo cams exist. I, yeah, I, it puzzled me at first, but there you go. Um, anyway, it was fine that if you were close enough, you could hack the stream of the video. Um, now, this is a, there, is a, um, there is a white hat hacker out there doing work. Um, to try and check for these kind of vulnerabilities in sex toys. And he has got the one, it, the project is called Internet of Dongs. And I really recommend you go and look at it. It's fantastic. And he is, he's actually partly funded. He's had, had a grant from Pornhub. Um, but to try and look for security flaws. So, and he's doing brilliant work. So, who owns the data? And it's a question that we see with all the products that we sign up for. Um, even if your data is, if, you, if you're following, you know, the company is following good data practice, um, what happens long term? What happens if the company goes under, if it merges? What happens if there's a data breach, like the Ashley Madison data breach? What happens if, you know, you, the, the whole, oh, if you've got nothing to hide, you've got nothing to fear, I just think that's such crap. And, you know, what happens if you have this data and you go to a country, say, where some kind of crazed president has recently taken over and you try to get in to the country and suddenly they're finding information about you um, that you're not happy about. It's just, this can happen. So even if you're within the law in your own country, what happens if you go somewhere else where the laws are different or if they change? Um, I mean, I'm living in London, and the UK is one of the, the most, um, it has the most surveillance of its citizens anywhere in Europe. And yeah, I've got nothing to hide, but I'm damn sure I'm not getting the government have my data. 
Okay, it's my feminist rant now. So we know there is a massive problem, massive problem with women in tech. Um, and we know that they're treated very badly. Um, and you know, recently, uh, last year, artificial intelligence was called out as being a sea of dudes, um, which it absolutely is. And we're trying to get way better ways of getting women integrated into it. But this technology, the sex robot technology specifically, is being designed by men for men. And the immediate reaction when you talk about these sex robots is people saying, oh, women don't want that. Well, first of all, women have never had them marketed to them in a form that they might like. And women are large consumers of sex toys. The sex toy market is actually, certainly in the UK, is actually split pretty much 50-50. A lot of people assume that women are buying more sex toys. Actually, it's, it's, it's quite a, a balanced market. So I think it's problematic, and we see it coming up time and time again. We're getting this constant um, bombardment that these sex robots always take the form of the femme fatale seductive woman. Now, I'm pretty sure a lot of you will have seen Ex Machina, which is good because I'll probably put some spoilers in. But um, Ex Machina, the, the premise of the story being eventually that, um, that the ro Eva, the robot, um, is able to use her feminine wiles uh, to get her own way. Um, now, it has been argued that this is a feminist film, and I don't agree with that. I think that's a very bad portrayal of feminism for how women get their own way and get ahead. But what I was interested in was the marketing. Um, now, I'm told that this was the US marketing. So I'm, I'm Q Meierine presenterer hemmeligheten bak smaksvinneren Q Gresk Yoghurt. Ta den fineste norske melken, bruk den originale greske metoden, og bland smaken selv. Nyhet, Q Gresk Yoghurt med 30% mindre sukker. No, it's not. Here we go. Okay. Ah, uh, what? Okay, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. You didn't miss anything. It was an advert for yoghurt. You all knew that. Right, hang on. There we go. Okay, let's start off with this. To erase a line between man and machine. Now, I don't know if you've ever noticed it, but this is one that really pisses me off because every time I see a conference talk with man and machine written in it, I want to punch someone. All it takes are the letters H and U before the man to make it fair, okay? And everyone says, oh, but it sounds better if you say man and machine. Yeah, well, then you're excluding 51% of your audience. So to raise the line between man and machine. Men and gods. Over the next few days, you're going to be the human component in the Turing test. One day the AIs are going to look back on us the same way we look at fossils. Hello. How do you feel about her? Oh man, she's amazing. You're impressed? <laughs> yes. Do you want to be my friend? Of course. Now the question is, how does she feel about you? Do you think about me when we are together? Did you give her sexuality as a diversion tactic? This is your insecurity talking. This is not your intellect. Bye. Did you know that I was brought here to test you? <laughs> does Ava actually like you? Or is she pretending to like you? Nathan, isn't your friend a wrong? Wrong about what? Everything. Do you want to be with me? Can we talk about the lies you've been spinning me? What lies? What lies? You have to help me. You have to help me. What will happen to me if I fail your test? Okay, so don't get me wrong, I think it's an amazing film. I think it's really well done. I think the AI side of things is portrayed extremely well. Um, I just have some issues, but it also raises some questions. And the bit that was in the trailer, why did you give her sexuality? An AI doesn't need a gender. She could have been a gray box. And Nathan's reply, I'm not sure that's true. Can you think of an example of consciousness at any level, human or animal, that exists without a sexual dimension? 
And that's how I got into this topic in the first place. I was working on cognitive systems, and we were talking about human-like computing, and we were saying, if you're trying to model the way humans think, why are you not building in some of the real fundamental goals? Because if you think of an AI agent as having goal-oriented behavior, our goal-oriented behavior is about replication. Conversely, if you take an inactive view of AI, if you're into the ecological side of it, it's about social behavior, and you don't get much more social and embodied than having sex. So this is what kind of steered me into the area. It's only this year, however, that people are starting to take it a little bit more seriously. So what's going to happen in the distant future? Okay, well, first of all, the people who make stock images are going to get really rich. <laughs> because every time you see a story about future AI, you get one of these. So, there are some good TV shows that talk a bit about this. Um, one of them is Humans. In the UK, it's Humans. I think in, the, in Sweden, it was Real Humans. Um, so, we have our UK version of this. And it was really nice because it talked about moral decisions of machines. Can we program a machine to have love and affection and care? Um, you know, in this case, there was a bit about the technological divide because in this picture you see um, this man has just lost his own companion robot because it, it, it is malfunctioning. And he gets given a, like a state care robot who's really basic and strict and firm. So I can see like a two-tier system where, you know, if you've got social health care, you get the really basic one. And if you've got private health care, you get the really glamorous one. Mm -hmm. So we do have a d digital divide that's happening, and we know that. Um, and it's only going to continue along this route. Um, in the lower picture, there's a, there's a robot sex worker called Niska. Um, and she, she, she kills a man, um, she kills one of her clients um, because she doesn't agree with his um, sexual practices. So it does raise a lot of interesting questions around that. So what happens then if we have robots that can think? Uh, at what point do we need to consider consent? At what point do we need to consider rights? Because will, if we can, you know, will we even recognize consciousness? We don't even recognize, we didn't recognize that much consciousness in a lot of animals. We're getting more and more awareness of the level of consciousness in animals. If you think of something like an octopus, you know, that's like the stuff they're capable of is quite incredible. I've stopped eating octopus. Fine with bacon, though, <laughs> even though pigs are really smart. Um, <laughs> so, you know, what happens? Do we, do we have to program? You know, if we, there's lots of ethical dilemmas, and this is where the philosophers get really excited, because, you know, it, sh should we, could we program a machine that is designed purely to love us and to please us? Should we have it built in so that it doesn't have to, you know, it, 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 could, cons um, it could withdraw consent? Should it have the right to its own sex life? or the right to family life. I know this sounds really far-fetched, but if this happens, we have to think about it. Can the machines love us? Is it enough for us to love the robot and for the robot to react to us as if it loves us? Because machines can't love us yet, if ever. So is it enough just to get that response back? Is that enough for us to feel attached, to feel rapport with the machine? Why do they have to look human? So I don't think they do. And I think that there's a problem with these real dolls and the like, is that they, there's like really strong uncanny valley effects. So the uncanny valley, the closer something looks to human, the wider the gulf is, the more repulsed we feel because it's not properly human. And there are lots of psychological theories as to why that is, one of them being that it reminds us of death. So it's a taboo. So I think we should be moving in new ways. We have got amazing materials at our disposal we have smart fabrics, we have conductive paint, we have um, soft robotics, we have so many things that we can play around with, and why aren't we doing that instead to make interesting things? And that's why I ran the sex tech hack back in December. It was the U UK's first sex tech hackathon. Since then, there's been one in Paris, and there's been one in New York. Um, and we got, I, had a, I kind of envisioned 10 people in a room sewing up vibrators. Um, and my students who are amazing, went, oh, no, no, no. We're going to get 100 people, and we're going to do this from scratch. Actually, we got 50 in the end. We had, we had about 150 applicants, and we selected about 80, and 50 turned up. Uh, so 14 teams working on innovative sex toys and sex tech. And we had absolutely no limits on what they could do. It was held in a converted church. Uh, that went down well with the newspapers. Um, and um, to a few just before Christmas. So we had a wonderful time, <laughs> and this is just a little snip of, snippet of what, was, God, what it was like.
Okay, so it's happening again this year. Um, it's going to happen in December the 16th and 17th, as far as I know. We'll be opening applications soon, and I'm going to give you a link at the end um, where I ask you for ideas, and if you want to find out more about that, you can sign up to our mailing list. But essentially, um, the whole idea was that taboo should not stifle innovation. So if I can just show you a little... One of my students who helped run it, Kevin. So the core question around this event that we posed was, should taboo stifle innovation? And we think absolutely not. Events like this are really cool because you get a bunch of really passionate people in the room, give them a challenge and then just see what they can build. And as long as everything's respectful, sex is something that happens, so we should be absolutely free to just talk about it. Mostly very exploratory stuff on sex technology, especially that I heard some people are doing um, exploring sound as a part of... Um, sexuality and in that form like the music and that sort of stuff so it's I think it's going to be a lot of interesting projects which explore that stuff in um, unseen ways not just dildos <laughs> and sex toys but more in a broader sense and explore how that could come in with technology and computer science. One of the really interesting things about hackathons is it allows people to explore a bunch of ideas in a really short amount of time. Quite often the process of creating hardware and creating software of any kind is quite a long one. And what this allows us to do is not only try out new ideas, but also try ideas that are terrible in a short amount of time. So they're also good for learning from failures. So I'm just going to show you the one, I know I'm running out of time now. And I just want to show you the winning um, thing for that. So we, we got lots of prizes. We had uh, sex toy companies donate a lot of prizes, which was great as well. And it was a really fun event. And we kept it very, very diverse, uh, very fair, very equal. It was about promoting tolerance. It was about having fun and sharing things. Um, the winning team was uh, a team working on soft robotics. Um, and they created this thing called LovePad. And LovePad was a silicone breast that you could manipulate and squeeze. And it drove um, little tentacles that could curl around your body. Um, and it was, it was so cool. It was done by air blowing into, into tubes. This is just a little example of that. So it, so it, doesn't, it can work on different sizes. I mean, if you tried it on this breast, you would see it would go around this breast, but it could also be on a flat yeah. chest and, and it's still be yeah, having exactly, because yeah. you feel the yeah. vibration. So it's about it's trying really to soft as well. capture these kind of uh, yeah, wow. tactile experiences and share them. Wow. And so this, this was supposed to all be inside one box. So really cool stuff. We had someone, we had a team that made a sexual cryptocurrency where you had to stimulate a physical wallet in order to generate your <laughs> coin. <laughs> the idea being that you could pay attention to money or you could pay attention to people, but you couldn't do both. We had someone else created a vibrating, a vibrating fist which read stock market data so you could literally write the system. Um, <laughs> uh, it was, there, were, there were lots of very cool things. So... Um, we're human in a world that's like increasingly full of machines, and we can't escape that. We, we're, these things are all happening around us. Um, we're working into, you know, we're into an age of automation, and we need to work with technology. It's being integrated into our lives. We can try banning things, but banning things never works. Prohibition never works. And the stuff is coming, and we need to shape it. And if we can get in and steer it in the direction we want before, say, the big, uh, the porn industry gets hold of it. The porn industry have done some wonderful technological developments, but I would like to see this steered in a different direction. So this is happening, and I think we should try and shape it in the way that we want. I would love your thoughts. I would love your ideas. I've put up a, a form. It's just a, a quick form about you know, s some of the, the stuff I've talked about, but also specifically asking you, what do you think we could do? Have you got ideas? Do you want to join our sex tech hackathon? Do you want to find out more? So if you go to futureintimacy.com forward slash NDC Oslo, um, you can do that. And you can also join the mailing list for our hackathon. But I hope now in the past kind of 50 minutes that I've actually you know, I may not have convinced you that this is a really good thing. You might have your own opinions, but I do want you to think that it is a serious thing, okay? Uh, with a lot of fun, but that it is something that is happening. It's not just a throwaway word in a newspaper headline. This is stuff with real life implications. And hopefully one way or another, um, you can see the pros and cons of it. So thank you. Happy to take questions.